Hello and welcome to this talk about uh, judicial review. In this talk I'm going to be dealing with what happens before you start the judicial review claim. My name's Declan O'Dempsey, I'm a barrister at Cloisters Chambers. One of the things you're going to have to read is the pre-action protocol, as it's called. Now this is something that the court expects you to do before you start a claim at all. There are rules about these contained uh, in the uh, practice direction. Before you consider whether or not you should start litigation, think about whether it is necessary to do so. Litigation is stressful. How are you going to deal with the stress of bringing a claim? If you're representing yourself, litigation is time intensive. Are you going to be able to devote the time that your claim will need? If you lose, can you afford to pay the other side's costs? Now, there are sometimes uh, situations in which you can get protection from having to pay the other side's costs and you will need to make an application uh, to the court to get that protection. So far as reasonably practicable or possible, the courts expect you to try and resolve the problem without litigation so that litigation is a last resort. So you should consider offering to resolve the dispute by alternative means such as mediation, that's where you get somebody who's neutral uh, to uh, sit down with you and the defendant and to uh, try and help you to reach an agreement. Or you could simply try direct negotiation where you put forward a suggested solution and uh, then the parties uh, gradually, hopefully, work uh, together towards the solution. It's important to do this because you will be required to show that you tried uh, to settle the dispute by alternative means where that was practicable. The protocols themselves, the administrative court, like the other civil courts, expects you to have uh, conducted negotiations with the defendant before starting legal action. And if you don't, you may get penalised, even if you win, by having to pay costs or not recovering your full claim for costs. And similarly, that's a rule that applies uh, to the other side. So the expectations of the court uh, for what you must do are set out in this document called the Pre-Action Protocol. And you can find this by searching uh, for Judicial Review Pre-Action Protocol at the link I've given you uh, there. You've got to remember this, that even if you are following one of these pre-action protocols, it does not give you extra time in which you can bring your claim for judicial review. So let's have a look at alternative dispute resolution and your pre-claim letter. So as I've said, you need to consider whether alternative dispute resolution would be better than litigation. So this consists of discussion with the defendant, negotiation, this kind of facilitated negotiation called mediation, but it also, in the context of administrative courts, involves referring the case to the ombudsman for the particular public authority with which you're concerned. Now, there is a little bit of formality about the letter before claim, and it's worth uh, considering that for a moment. Annex A to the protocol, the link for which I've given you uh, on the screen, uh, says that the letter before claim, or the pre-claim letter, must contain some obvious things, your name and address, that of the defendant, that of any interested parties, and if you've got one, your legal advisor. It's also got to contain reference details which the defendant has for the matter in dispute. So for example, this might be the reference number or the identity of the person who's previously been dealing with the matter. You should set out a brief summary of the facts and the relevant legal principles. You should set out the date and details of the decision or other act 
or omission, which you're challenging. And you should also set out why you say that that thing is wrong. You're supposed to set out the action that you want the defendant to take and any proposals that you're making to resolve or perhaps narrow the dispute by alternative dispute resolution. You should set out any details of any information that you're seeking, which is related to an identifiable issue in the dispute. And this is to enable everybody to resolve or reduce the number of issues uh, in your case. You can also use this letter to request a fuller explanation of the reasons for the decision that you're challenging. You should give details of any documentation or um, any policy document in respect of which you're seeking uh, disclosure. So in other words, for them to send you the documents. You should explain why the documents are relevant to the issues that you've set out. And then you should give the address for a reply by the defendant or other party and for service of court documents. Now normally if you're the claimant that's going to be your own address. If you're represented it's likely to be the address of your legal representative. You should give 14 days to the, the defendant to respond to the letter unless there's good reasons uh, for not doing so. And you may think you've got good reasons but ultimately the decision is going to be for the court. So if they think later on that your reasons are not very good for giving a short period of time. Again, you may get penalised for not having observed the rules that you're supposed to observe in respect of sending one of these letters. There are various ways in which your claim might fall at the first hurdle. First of all, you must have a what's called a sufficient interest in the matter to which the claim relates. That's a statutory requirement. And even if the defendant agrees to you being treated as if you have a sufficient interest, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as standing, or sometimes Latin comes in, locus standi. Even if you've got the agreement of the other parties, then the court still has to consider whether you actually do have sufficient interest as far as the court's concerned. And if you don't, then that's going to be the end of the case. You simply can't bring one of these claims if you don't have sufficient interest. So what's the test that's going to be applied? Well, it's something along the lines of if a decision directly and adversely affects you, then it would be surprising if you were not going to be able to uh, claim uh, relief uh, because the court thinks you don't have standing. So if the decision directly and adversely affects you, you're very likely to have this kind of sufficient standing. The second way in which claims can frequently fail is if there's another method of challenge which is open to the claimant. And if that method of challenge provides an adequate remedy. Now in those cases the court will almost always require that the alternative remedy should be exhausted before you apply for judicial review. So what am I talking about here? We're talking about things like an internal complaint mechanism or a statutory appeal mechanism. You need to have exhausted those before you bring your claim for a judicial review. Or you must be able to argue that those alternative remedies are not uh, the most uh, practicable way of resolving uh, the problem. But it's quite rare for that type of argument to succeed. A third way in which uh, a claim may fail is if it's academic. So if there's nothing that will directly affect your rights or the defendant's obligations, there are some exceptions to this and have a look at the uh, Administrative Court's Guide to Judicial Review published in 2016 at paragraph 5.3.4.2. A major way in which claims can fail is if the outcome of the challenge is unlikely to be substantially different. So in other words, if the decision would have been the same, even if the error you claim had not been made, 
then the court is highly unlikely to grant you relief. There are some exceptions to the strictness of that rule. Uh, for example, in relation to some of the cases surrounding the public sector equality duty. Finally, if your claim is challenging a decision of the High Court, the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court, or a Crown Court which is dealing with a trial on indictment, then the Judicial Review Court simply won't uh, entertain it. One thing that people frequently worry about is the time limit for bringing uh, judicial review claims. Now the rule about bringing judicial review claims uh, is not that you must bring the claim within three months after the grounds uh, for making the claim first arise. In fact the rule is that your claim form must be filed promptly and in any event not later than three months after the grounds for making the claim first arose. So note that it's not a, a three month time limit, but it's a test of whether you've acted promptly. You, uh, or even you with the defendant or the defendant itself are unable to extend the three month uh, time limit period. That is something that the court can do. It can decide that you've acted promptly nonetheless you should note this, that time starts from the date on which the decision you're challenging was made and not when you became aware of the decision having been made. There are a number of special cases relating to time. So for example, if your case is a planning case, note this, you must start your claim not later than six weeks after the grounds uh, on which you, uh, the grounds that you're saying allow you to make the claim first arose. Secondly, if your claim relates to a public procurement procedure, this is the procedure by which public bodies outsource public services, you have to start your claim not later than 30 days after the date you knew or ought to have known that the grounds for claim arose. And note the difference there, that's linked to your knowledge, but the time limits we've discussed so far aren't linked to your knowledge. If your claim relates to the review of an upper tribunal decision, then it, the rule is that you must bring the claim no later than 16 days after the date on which notice of the upper tribunal's decision was sent to you. And then finally, in relation to public inquiries, a judicial review of a decision of a minister in relation to a public inquiry or a member of an inquiry panel has a 14-day time limit, unless that time limit is extended by the court. Now note, this does not apply to challenges to the report resulting from a public inquiry, or indeed a decision that you couldn't have been aware of until publication of that report. So what happens if you're likely to be too late? There's a general power under the Civil Procedure Rules, the CPR, to extend time for doing something, even if the time limit has expired. If your three months have gone past, you should get hold of Form N461 and go to Section 8. You've got to apply for an extension of the time limit for bringing your claim. And the judge who considers whether you get permission to proceed with your claim will also, at the same time, consider whether you should get an extension of the time for starting your claim. So you'll need to present evidence, and that means writing a witness statement saying what happened and referring to the documents which are relevant, about why there was a delay and explaining your lack of promptness, so why you didn't get on with it. Secondly, the court will consider whether allowing your application to, as they say, extend time, will cause substantial hardship or prejudice to the defendant or any other person. So you should try and address that in your witness statement and application. Third, the court will also need to be convinced by you that granting your application won't be detrimental to good administration. 
you'll need to consider what, if anything, you can say to show that there won't be consequences for good administration by the public authority if you're allowed to proceed despite the passage of time. There is a peculiarity about claims for judicial review, which is that you have to get permission from the court actually to start your claim. So the very first thing you do in the claim is to ask permission to go ahead with it. Throughout your case, you're going to need to keep the court office and the defendant informed about what's happening in your case. I'll just say a little word about this. Corresponding with the defendant may be daunting to you, but don't avoid it because it causes you stress. In an earlier talk, I said that the parties to a claim are responsible for observing what's called the overriding objective. What this means in practice is that you and the defendant are responsible for getting the case into a fit state for the judge, who is another person, to understand what needs to be decided by them. So you need to identify the issues in the case. That's what needs to be decided by the judge. And you're also responsible, along with the defendant, for getting the case into a fit state for the judge to be able to understand what each side's arguments are without too much difficulty. So let's think about some points that you could use in writing or talking to the court or the defendant and the judge. And the first rule of thumb is always think about your audience. Keep your arguments short and simple. And whilst there's no magic to it, my guidance for you would be that long sentences, lots of relative clauses are out. Short sentences are in. So if you can express something in a number of different sentences, then do it that way rather than linking all the ideas together by using relative clauses. So those rules apply to everything you do in your case, whether you're speaking to the judge or when you're writing something which you want to be understood by somebody else in the case. Uh, unless you understand it, and I mean really understand it, avoid legalese. You're going to have to refer to certain principles of law, but try and avoid legal jargon wherever you can. So, we're looking at beginning the claim. You have to write a claim form. That's how you begin. And then you must do what they call issuing it. So this means making sure that the administrative court office receives it. The start date for a claim, so that's the date that the clock stops for the court deciding whether or not you've acted promptly, is going to be the earlier date of either the date on which the administrative court office received the document or the date on which the claim form is issued by the administrative court office. So it's going to be the earlier of those two. For the purposes of calculating time, however, from the date of issue of the proceedings for any other purpose, what you have to do is look at the claim form and find the date shown in the court seal as the date of issue, because the court is going to send you, in due course, a copy of the claim form which has been sealed with the court seal, and that's going to have the detail you need. Don't forget the, to pay the fee. If you do forget, your claim form and all the other documentation will be refer, returned to you, and you won't have stopped the clock for the purposes of that time limit. The documents you need to start your claim are two copies of the completed judicial review claim form. These are going to be retained by the court office, the ACO Administrative Court Office. And then you're going to need additional copies of the judicial review claim form 
sufficient for the numbers of others who are involved in the claim. So if you've got a defendant and an interested party, then you're going to need two more. What happens with these is that the court office seals them and gets them back to you. And when you get them back, you have to serve them on the others involved in the case. So Annex 3 to the Administrative Court Judicial Review Guide gives you the addresses for service of various government departments. You've got to apply, uh, provide the accompanying documentation that you have in the same numbers. So now we're going to have a look at what that accompanying documentation looks like. First of all, there's the claim form. Section 4 of the claim form for judicial review automatically includes an application for permission to bring the claim. In the form, you must spell out what remedy you're seeking the court to give if you're successful. And the claim form has to be accompanied by a number of documents. First, a detailed statement of reasons uh, why you seek judicial review of the decision. You'll hear these referred to as your grounds or the grounds for judicial review. These are the grounds on which you seek judicial review. The rule there is that you should be as brief as possible, but set out your arguments in full. So don't be repetitious. Try and keep your arguments short and try and put your most important arguments at the start. Remember, a judge is going to be reading this and deciding whether or not you can go ahead with the claim. So put your best point first. Next, you have to provide a statement of the facts upon which you rely. Section 9 of the claim form gives you space to do this. If you need more space, don't worry, you can use it, you can attach documents and so forth. In the claim form, section 8 gives you space to deal with any other applications you may have. Now, you may have an application to extend time for bringing the claim uh, or for other directions, so that's things you want to happen in terms of the procedure that will bring the case to a hearing, full hearing. Next, you need to supply written evidence in support of the uh, claim. This will include a copy of the decision letter or order that you're dealing with, um, or the court or tribunal's um, reasons for the decision if you're challenging a tribunal or court decision. You should provide any relevant statutory material. Now, these are the acts and statutory instruments. You can find these on the government website and you may want to provide just the relevant bits of any act or statutory instrument rather than the whole lot. And then finally, uh, you should include copies of any documents which you intend to reply to rely on. So the documentation should be provided in an indexed and paginated bundle. Now that means you should put the documents into one pack with the decision document at the front. And then what you do is construct a timeline, a chronology, a chronological order of the documents from the earliest relevant document through to the end. A simple way of doing this is by, if there are a lot of documents, grouping things, documents into years and then into months and then working out within each one of those what the sequence is. And then you put everything in chronological order. Now, once you've got your whole pack together, you give it one number system, just one. So you don't start the numbering again at any point. You just run it through from start uh, to uh, finish. And then having started at the first page after the index at page number one, you carry on. I would suggest you put the legislation and statutory material after the documentation, but you continue that numbering and then you're going to be referring the judge to those pages uh, in your index 
it allows everybody to be at the same place in the bundle at the same time. So this is a really important thing that you need to do. You'll have to make two copies over the number of people who are involved in the case. Remember the administrative court office retains two copies and everybody else in the case needs to have a copy. Uh, if you don't provide the documentation and you don't explain why, as I've said, your claim form may be returned to you and you won't have issued or started the claim. In other words, time will carry on running and the court may ultimately decide you didn't act promptly and therefore your claim will fail. There are five administrative court offices in England and Wales, uh, at Birmingham, Cardiff, Leeds, Manchester, and in London, they're at the Royal Courts of Justice. It's sensible to file your claim in the court office with which you've got the closest connection, but you can issue in another court office, uh, and I've referred you to the paragraph in the guide that uh, will help you to decide whether you want to go somewhere else. You will have to justify taking that course of action. And you should note that the court in any event can send you to the more appropriate uh, court office for your claim to be processed. If it's going to do that, it'll seek everybody's views first. I want to say something about filing documents. Um, you should assume that the court office won't accept service of documents by email or fax. However, there are exceptions to this, so always check with the Administrative Court Office before uh, sending whether or not your document can be sent by email. You should also check with the individual office how many pages they're prepared to accept in this way, because there are different page limits which vary from place to place. If the document requires a fee, you can't service, serve it by uh, email or fax. You should also ask whether the email, now this includes attachments, exceeds the page limit. And again, if so, you can't use the email or fax for serving it. And you should look at the actual megabyte size of the document plus attachments. If it's more than 10 megabytes in size, it's going to be unlikely that you can uh, serve it by email. Note that this applies to all documents, so it applies also to the skeleton argument which uh, you'll be doing, and um, which we'll say something about later on. You should only use a fax in an emergency to send bundles uh, or documents that require a fee to be paid, and you should accompany that fax along with an undertaking to pay the fee. If your document isn't completely received by 4 p.m. on a particular day, it'll be treated as being received on the following day. So don't leave things to the last minute in any event, and certainly don't leave things to the last minute and then try to send things by fax and run the risk of it not arriving uh, during the time allowed for you to do whatever it is you're supposed to be doing. Uh, any email must have your name, uh, telephone number, and address or email address on it. And all attachments should be in plain text or rich text format, uh, rather than hypertext markup um, language.